Hello, everyone. Welcome to MetaCast, the podcast of the Meta Analysis Academy. My name is Randerson Cardozo, and I have the honor here of sharing this podcast with Isabella Marques, Amanda Godoy, and Gabriela Brandão. I'm going to start by asking you to introduce yourself. Let's start with Gabriela. Yeah, here. sure. So, as Hunter said, my name is Gabriela. I'm finishing a research fellowship here at Baptist Rodriguez Medical Center uh, in pancreatic surgery and about to start my residency in general surgery at the same institution. And uh, in the Meta Analysis Academy, I'm one of the mentors. So, I do mentoring one on one with the students about Meta Analysis, of course. It's a pleasure. Thanks for joining, Gabriela. Amanda? Hello, everyone. My name is Amanda. I am from Brazil, and I'm, a cur I'm currently a fourth-year medical student in the UK in Wales, Cardiff University. Hi, everyone. My name is Isabella Marquez. I am a physician, graduated in Spain. I am originally from Brazil, but I've been a little bit everywhere, Spain, Germany, and now here. Now I am a postdoc research fellow at one of the Harvard-affiliated hospitals, even though the Meta-Analysis Academy has no affiliation with any of the institutions that we mentioned. Um, and I have just started eight months ago. It's been eight months already that I am here in Boston working with research for a job, for a living. <laughs> And my name is Randerson Cardoso. As I said, I'm a cardiologist here in Boston, in the United States. I currently work at Harvard Medical School. As Isabella said, this uh, podcast, the Meta Analysis Academy, is not affiliated with uh, any of the institutions where we work. I want to start this podcast by explaining what is the Meta Analysis Academy. We have a very high-level training program that enables our students to do systematic reviews and meta-analysis. We teach the right methods, the statistics, the writing, so that you're able to do systematic reviews and meta-analysis with autonomy. I want to make it very clear that we do not do the publications for our students. We do not guarantee publications. You will hear all about the incredible incredible work that these doctors, medical students have done in our program, but it is their work. It is the results of their hard work and their dedication. The Meta-Analysis Academy will give you the support and the methods to get there. And speaking of results, let's start with that. All of you have taken the Meta-Analysis Academy within the last one to two years. Can you tell me your results? Let's start with Isabella, queen of the Meta-Analysis Academy. Chosen one. I hold the title of the first student who published a Meta-Analysis as first author in the entire cohort of students. That was two years ago or something like two that. Two years ago and yeah. 700 publications ago of our students. Go ahead. <laughs> That's a lot, guys. That's amazing. Uh, ever since, so in these two years, when I started, I was a fifth year medical student in Spain. Didn't know anything about research. And now, two years later, I have 11 meta-analysis published as full papers, published and indexed in PubMed. And approximately something like 40 abstracts presented in international conferences. Something like this. Congratulations. Who would have thought? <laughs> Amanda? Well, I think the issue that we were speaking about before is that I should have counted before I came here. <laughs> it's a common theme that you do lose count when you start the Meta Analysis Academy. What I can say is that I have at least 10 publications uh, published on, on PubMed, and I also have at least 25 abstracts, I would say, with more than five oral presentations as well, international conferences. And I was just finishing my first year of medical school when I started. So it's been incredible. Congratulations, Amanda. I'm going to say my numbers too, but with the caveat that I started doing this 10 years ago. So I have 80 publications right now, about 1,500, 1,700 citations, more than 300 abstracts presented in conferences. But if you consider the number of years that I've been doing this, all of you have done more than me in the years that you've been doing this. So, Gabriela, how about your results? Yeah, sure. For me, it was easy to take track because I just applied for residency. Yeah. So, uh, in my year as application, I had 18 PubMed index publications and seven of, seven of them were meta-analysis. So, that's a very powerful uh, tool for issuing your CV. So, I... And it resulted on the a successful application for residency. I'm here. I am. Like, Congratulations! Yeah. And we're gonna we're gonna <laughs> wow, jump right yeah. into that because <laughs> one of the key messages that we share in the Meta Analysis Academy is that it's not just about publications. It's about how it will impact your career. 
And uh, I can think of no better example than your amazing results. So tell everyone, please, about you know, your yeah, spectacular sure. match. Not only uh, publication was not only used for us uh, to show how I can uh, perform and uh, make a project from the scratch to the end to uh, show how can I finish a project, but I also uh, took that as um, a very useful tool to make connections. And I think for residency application, that's key, like the networking we do with that. And and so a lot of those publications, especially meta-analysis, uh, I could make the networking throughout uh, the project. So I could uh, ask for senior authors, and they were in different institutions. At the time of the application, I could reach out to them I uh, and ask for help, ask for some recommendations, and that was totally key for me. So I think that speaks more, even more about the power of it. So the publications, the networking, and what's the result? Tell them about your match. Yeah, I so I was approved for a categorical general surgery program at the Harvard Institution. So it's a very it's mind dream. blowing. Yeah. It's, it's mind the dream. Blowing. It's the yeah. dream. If I mean, there was anything that could have been more perfect, it, yeah. is that you know, is that yeah. kind of match. Yeah, I mean, many of you guys know about the importance and the difficulty of getting a general surgery categorical match. Uh, let alone at Harvard Medical School, and um, Gabriela accomplished all of that. Amanda, tell us about how meta-analysis, your publications that you mentioned, how they have helped your career still in medical school. I mean, that's a f loaded question, I would say, because I don't remember the Amanda before she started the Meta-Analysis Academy uh, I've grown so much professionally in knowledge, in opportunities that have been provided to me. I remember that I've, I've always been a very dedicated student. I was very hardworking and I would ask for opportunities. But we were talking about this earlier. It's very easy to ask for opportunities. It's very easy, let's say, to be hardworking. But people don't care if you're hardworking. They don't really care if you're just trying to get there or how much you know, even. They ma what matters is the results. There is a, sa a saying that I really like, that there's nothing more useless than just a merely in well-informed man. And I think I really learned this when publishing meta-analysis. When I started getting my publications, my results, that's when people started reaching out to me. Opportunities started just appearing and doors started opening my career. So from just a medical student who would look for opportunities, try to publish, try to get to involved in research. Now I present at international conferences. I have my name on PubMed. I have emails from journals inviting me to review their paper. And I participate in primary research, a really high impact primary research, even though I haven't even finished medical school. And it's a scary thought to think that next year I will graduate and what is out there for me. But I'm um, it makes me more confident that I've built a track record with meta-analysis that hopefully will get me somewhere that is has a high level of impact for my future career as well. Well, it's the hard work that pays off, right? Because the hard work, of course, is important, but it's 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 important. It's also critical to have the results, and we're going to talk more about that, about the differences of putting in hard work and other types of research and meta-analysis. Isabella, what kind of opportunities have you had for your publications uh, in your career? Well, I'll start saying that it's funny how stories repeat themselves all over. So Amanda is studying in Ga Wales, mm -hmm. in Gales, Gales in Portuguese, <laughs> in Wales, and I was studying in Spain, guys. And you might think, wow, is this limited to my country? Like, why is it so hard doing research here? It's so funny how it's, it seems to be like that everywhere, right? Because I also, same as Amanda said, I don't remember Isabella before, and I would try so hard to get opportunities, so hard. It's not like I was sitting and waiting for opportunities to come. I would really try, and the amount of no's that I got only lose to the amount of no responses that I got. <laughs> and then, after I published my first meta-analysis, after I finished the course, I started getting, uh, same thing, invitations from the dean of my university, from professors, being like, wow, Isabella, you're a student. You, have, you know how to make meta-analysis. And I'm like, yes, I know. I was still, I, I'm the same that I was 
six months ago, but somehow now you notice me. But at the same time, I have to admit I'm not the same because now I have something like to bring to the table. <laughs> and that has really been kind of like the mindset that allowed me to dream bigger and to be here now as a postdoc research fellow in Boston. Who would have thought? Yeah. Same thing. It's pretty incredible. Um, let me explain to you guys briefly what a meta-analysis is. Many of you may know, but it's, I think it's important to highlight this. A meta-analysis is, the, is uh, putting together statistically, quantitatively, the results of studies that are similar to each other. So if you have a study that was done in Spain, in the United Kingdom, in Brazil, in the United States, if you have these different studies and they were similar to each other, those authors analyze them independently, of course, and publish them. But then as meta-analysis authors, what we do is we have the idea, we do the right methods for identifying those studies, and then we put them together statistically. That's a meta-analysis. Let's talk a little bit about the advantages of this particular research method. And I'll start with this. My favorite one is autonomy. It's just the fact that no matter where you are, you know, um, in, in, in the world. We just had a colleague here with us who is from a small city, very small city in the countryside of Brazil. We have students from India, from uh, everywhere in the world that, who don't otherwise have access to research, and the meta-analysis gives them autonomy. Amanda, can you tell, like, expand on that a little bit? You know, how is it that people, um, how is it that I'm saying that people from anywhere in the world, if they understand the right method, of course, and they have a computer and internet access, they can do a meta-analysis. Great, Uranus, and uh, thank you for that comment because autonomy, many people confuse it with just doing it by yourself. True. Whereas when we speak about autonomy in meta-analysis, it's not that you're just conducting a meta-analysis alone. Actually, joining a community of well-minded, like-minded individuals in the Meta Analysis Academy, for example, that's what makes it powerful. That's where what takes you to the end. But when we say autonomy, is that you know how to conduct it every step of the way. You probably, if you have any knowledge of research methods out there listening to us, you probably know that every step of research should be checked by at least two people. So of course you're not gonna be conducting a meta-analysis by yourself. But instead of being that student that you're emailing people asking for opportunities, you know the method and actually you can put together your research team because you know how to conduct it and probably the people that are with you also do. It creates autonomy in the sense that you can, you're able to take it to the end. You don't depend on, well, money. That's a big one. You don't depend on an ethics committee to approve your research, which takes a lot, a long time, guys. If you, if you don't know, maybe primary research takes at least more than a year to conduct. To publish, that's another, mm -hmm. another story. And meta-analysis can be done as quickly as, would say, five weeks, you know, from having the idea to publishing can be discussed. Yeah, you, you mentioned a lot there. You know, mm -hmm. we talked about the autonomy, just how quick it is, the fact that you don't depend on an ethics committee. And you mentioned about doing it in a group. And um, I want to ask Gabriela this question because I know you have a spectacular group with, you know, Bruna mm -hmm. and uh, Patricia, you know, and so many other people, you know, Sergio and other other great minds from the Meta-Analysis Academy. So tell us a little bit about um, if you knew all of them before, if you met them in the Meta-Analysis Academy, what it's been like to work in this research group, how many publications you guys have. I see one every week now. Yeah. Tell us a little bit I'm about sure. that. Every month I think there is a publication coming from that group. And I think that's so value. Like when you have a very hardworking group and everyone shares res different responsibilities, the work just flows, right? So we can share uh, different steps of the, the, the process together and have those results. Uh, I met some of them before and then I brought them to the team because I knew how sh like hardworking they were and that it would like add to the group. But some of them I met on the way because we find ourselves when we have this goal, right? We are looking for surgery, we have the same path al uh, along the way, and we are all hardworking, which is And you're part of the Meta Analysis Academy. Yeah, so we find ourselves there with the same goal, and that's the best way to find your group. 
like you're going for the same way. Yeah. And we have so many examples of this in Meta Analysis Academy. Even Isabella, she she went she started in the Meta Analysis Academy. She joined That's an so incredible <laughs> research group that up to this day has we incredible still work results. Together. We like I actually have I love to share this because I have all the possibilities of groups that you can form to make a meta-analysis. I have worked with all of them and they all gave incredible results. I have worked, and this is such a coincidence, I have worked with Amanda before, I have worked with Gabby before, I have worked in completely different areas, like with Amanda mm -hmm. in endocrinology, mm -hmm. with Gabby. That's yeah. actually funny because Gabby was the one that solved the problem with statistics. <laughs> so the thing is, guys, um, in the meta-analysis academy, we learn how to make every step of the way, right? So we learn how to do our own statistics and all that. And we had a very like hard to overcome obstacle in one of our ideas. And surprisingly, Gabby was the one, one in the group of the community that knew how to do that. And we were like, hey, <laughs> hi Gabby, are you interested in joining, helping us and you know, join the publication? She saved our lives <laughs> and now it's published and it's already has like, it already has like two citations or something, this paper that we have together and with Amanda, the same, we put together, I knew two people that had the same idea of meta-analysis. Because mm -hmm. that's also one thing that we learn in the course, like how to have your own ideas, right? And it's funny because when we teach the methods, people start, start getting the same ideas because, yes. you know, they're good ideas. <laughs> they, they are viable. Let's talk about the ideas. Uh, sorry, Gabriela, no, just one, one second. Let's talk about developing ideas. Uh, you've published in pediatrics and infectious disease and cardiology, and you're not a specialist yet. You've published anesthesiology, Amanda, endocrinology. Yes. Amanda's yes. published in endocrinology and surgery, and others not in, not not a specialist in those areas yet. Gabriela published a ton in surgery. We'll start residency now. Tell us a little bit about how you developed these ideas for your projects, many of which you were first authors in. Yeah, I think. For me, at least, I, I went uh, after the topics I really liked. And I think one really cool thing about meta analysis you can go for the latest of the uh, like new projects out there and put it all the together and create like a masterpiece. Mm -hmm. So you can uh, publish a very late, like trending topic. Uh, it's still trending, and that's, that's cool. So I went after those uh, topics. But I know there's a lot of other ways, of mm. course. Yeah, we have a class one of the Meta Analysis Academy teaches this method that Gabriela just mentioned of looking at recent clinical trials, recent studies to develop your own ideas. And how about you, Amanda? I really like the method as well of the randomized trials. I, I get randomized trials on my my inbox, on my email every day, every day with viable ideas. And I think you become so effective at looking at new ideas that you just don't have the time to pursue it all. So I do have a lot of people that I help in, in the academy, in the community, that I say, like, listen, I, I found this viable idea. I just do not have the time because I have so many other meta-analysis yeah. projects going on. Would you take it forward? And uh, I, I've had two that have taken to the end and had it published. And I think that's the good thing that we kind of touched upon the community aspect of it. When you... If you already know the word of academia, it can be quite competitive. It can be quite frustrating at times because the collaboration might not be exactly as you expected. And I think the difference in the Meta Analysis Academy is that we end up helping each other, not only with the ideas, but with the process, with the research. And I think for me, at least that's the value of the collaboration aspect. We grow together, not alone. But coming back to the ideas aspect of it, besides randomized trials, when I started Meta Analysis Academy, I was very early on in my clinical years. So one topic that we that we always have is bedside, having ideas on the bedside, looking at patients. And I I thought that this wasn't a viable way for me to get ideas because I thought mm, I have no clinical experience. But again, when you know about how to conduct meta analysis, when you when you know about the process. It only takes one moment, it only takes one conversation, maybe when you're doing ward rounds with a doctor to start an idea. And that was, that was one of the ideas that I, that I started as well, in surgery, in fact, with a kidney transplantation, that we, we got an idea on the bedside. And I think 
it is a very effective way as well because you're seeing it right in, there and then the problem of the clinical doubt should we should we use this method or should it should we do it more conservative so we was comparing more surgical management conservative management and i think it's a, it can be a really good method as well so i like that one that's a good one i've actually so i think i've used all of our nine, ten methods of getting ideas. <laughs> that she, she's referring to the Meta-Analysis Academy, nine to ten methods exactly. that we teach so in class one. We have some methods that are very straightforward to kind of like switch the key in your brain to l actively look for ideas. And that's so true what Amanda was commenting. I feel like um, we go year after year in med school or medical training, and in the beginning, one of the methods that I liked the most was the one that Gabby said as well. I love checking latest publications at JAMA, at um, now Jack Imaging, and all these to look for, for ideas on like these super hot topics. There are latest published clinical trials and all that. That, really like that one. But I will admit that one of my favorites is actually checking guidelines. So there is also this crazy, crazy brilliant idea that is looking for kind of inconsistencies in guidelines from big societies. And they will literally mention to your face, like, hey, this is something we don't really have clear. Um, we have this evidence, but it's kind of lacking. One of my favorites. You're giving away Works all every our time. secrets. <laughs> <laughs> Works every time. I'm not kidding. Well, I mean, she's talking about them, but how to actually perform and get these ideas. I guess they can <laughs> learn in the meta-analysis academy. Can, you can discover in the course. So yeah. I want to talk about a, a subject here on how meta-analysis can be either a gateway for people to start research or complementary in, um, in the research portfolio. So for example, in my own career, I was a first year resident at the University of Miami. I needed to publish to get into a cardiology fellowship and I had zero experience. I did not have any PubMed publications yet. And I learned how to do this, and it took, my career took off. You know, in three years or four years of residency, because I was also chief, I published 20 papers. This really helped me to match into a really competitive program at Johns Hopkins. And now I participate in clinical trials, and I do all these things. But meta-analysis was the first publication. That's how I started, I think, for Isabella too. But Gabriela, you mentioned 18 or 19 publications, seven are meta-analysis. So clearly you've done a lot of other things that are not meta-analysis. You did yeah. a research fellow here. So tell us a little bit about how, even though you, you have research experience otherwise, meta-analysis contributed to your portfolio and to your career. Sure, and I think uh, you can have this as one of your tools for uh, be a better researcher. And for me, it was interesting because I had a lot of a lot of publications before, like considerably, but uh, not all of them, or the least of them, were surgery focused or barely touched the surgery topic. And I was missing like a real, like clinical surgery patient uh, research on my CV, like to show more interest. I was not like that. I was into it, into the surgical techniques. I was uh, ready for it. So that was the first. Um, uh, appealing of the meta-analysis meta for me, but later, uh, even already having some meta-analysis published, I came for a research fellow, and to do a primary research, it takes a long time, and I had five months to apply when I came, so I thought I would take my, my box again and I would use the meta-analysis tool, and that's when I uh, used my, my first publication here and the research fellow was a systematic review because that would be quick, that would be useful. I could present them a conference, which I would do the networking for residency. So it was very useful for me on that way. And you can impress your mentors, right? Yeah. I'm sure people were impressed it was like about this three new, weeks yeah, this new job. research yeah. fellow who just joined. You know, yeah. she doesn't even know where the bathroom is yet, and she's already publishing. Yeah, already publishing less than a month. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's incredible. It nice. Congratulations. And uh, let's talk more about time, and just about how long it takes. You know, you said, oh, you can easily do it in five months, which is the time that you had before your application. Uh, Isabella, you are author of the first publication of the Meta-Analysis mm -hmm. Academy. I remember uh, that was uh, almost two years ago now. Mm -hmm. You joined the course. How long did it take you to do that one and then others that followed? So that one doesn't count for time-wise because I was still taking the course. So I would learn a new topic every week. And I had to wait until I would learn that new topic to apply that in my idea. 
Um, so that one, I think I had this idea around week four of the course and by week 10, it was pretty much ready for submission. But that does count. It's super fast. That's six that weeks. Count That's incredible. <laughs> afterwards, not kidding you guys, I, I think that summer break, uh, my friends and I, so one of, I mentioned before how many groups I was able to form inside the community. One of the best ones I keep in my heart, I think all of them are the best ones. I keep them all in my heart. But the reason why I joined the Met Academy that was one of my best friends that insisted so much that I would join her. So we would do research together. And I was like, okay, Bella, her name is also Isabella. I'm like, Bella, you won. Okay, we're joining together. And then that summer break, we found one idea. We checked, it was viable. We're like, we don't have anything to do. <laughs> it's way too hot in Barcelona. <laughs> I don't want to go out. I think we finished that meta-analysis in like two weeks. That's amazing. Two weeks. And we were four in the group. So it's not like we have, you know, 20 people working. It's four of us, internet connection, and that was it. And mm -hmm. a lot of hard work. You know, the two weeks is, is obviously very fast, but I would say that our students generally complete a meta-analysis on average probably around five weeks once you've learned the method. Of course... If, if you're really good at it and you have experience, you could do it even faster, like Isabella. If you, it, it also depends on how much time you have on your hand, like if you're on a summer break. It depends on the number of studies. So there are a lot of variables in the process, but you can do it super fast. Amanda, tell us a little bit why it's so fast. What, uh, how come a clinical trial takes so much longer? Even a cohort study takes so much longer. In a meta-analysis, you can just do it that fast. Definitely. Well... What we're saying here is definitely not taking the value of primary research. They are very important and we use them in our meta-analysis, of course. But I think it's getting the idea and getting it approved by an ethics committee, it takes a long time. It might take a few months in there for approval, for changes that you have to make in the protocol, and then actually starting the trial or the observational study. And it can take a long time for recruitment, for analysis of data, then gathering that data, collecting, writing the manuscript. So it can take a couple years until you publish. Whereas meta-analysis, all the data is in there in the literature. You just need a good idea, your computer, a good group, right? And that comes with the autonomy and the community. And there you go. Mm -hmm. you, you just need to put it together. You just need to know an effective method that we teaching the meta analysis Academy. So it's those two components. It's the fact that you don't need to go to the ethics mm -hmm. committee or build a, a long protocol, and then the data is already already available. That's it. You mm -hmm. summarized it beautifully. Yeah. And, and then you can do it quickly. Exactly. Yeah. And then I think it, that, that's what makes it so uh, powerful because you don't need, especially when the topic is very hot and there are some re really new trials, like Gabby said, of, yeah. oh, you get uh, the notification of a new trial came out. And then you realize that in introduction, in the introduction, they say, oh, these trials have also come out, and they talk about conflicting results. That might be a good idea for the meta-analysis, and you just need to get started. A good example is one of our colleagues. She is a resident in endocrinology from Brazil, and she's presenting now at one of the conferences that is happening here in Boston. And she had a great idea on a very hot topic, and she just had just entered the meta-analysis academy, and Randerson, who was really good friends with her, said, we're going to help you. Don't worry. Don't you worry. So he helped her to get in touch with me and other colleagues. And in the group, we really, really sped up the meta-analysis. The data was already there. It was a hot topic. So I think that's the power of meta-analysis. You can have a good impact in the literature, summarizing data, increasing the power of those analyses. We can touch a little bit on power on another, another, another time. But I think that's the, the beauty of the method. I think that meta-analysis specifically, we did it in way less than four weeks. I don't remember exactly. I think it was just, it went by so fast. And Deadline now mode, right? Deadline mode. We there have are this students thing. that does like in a couple days. That's yeah. crazy. Yeah, I, 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 <laughs> I, I would say that especially with incredible people in Meta-Analysis Academy, like you, you guys, there's so many incredible people in the community. I definitely remember being in deadline mode, submitting abstracts yeah. in two, three days. Yes. Um, it's a journey. It's a journey, and it's definitely worth the effort. Of course. 
Guys, let's talk about a contentious topic here, which is the value of a research fellow in residency United States application, in application for residency in the United States. Controversial. Yeah, controversial. Uh, it depends on multiple factors, but I know many of you are specialists in this topic here. Let's start with Gabriela. Gabriela, yeah. you did it both. You did research fellowship. You did a bunch of meta-analysis and publications. You got a great match. Tell us about doing a research fellow, yes or no, for the people who are listening and interested in residency in the United States? The answer is depends. <laughs> <laughs> There's no uh, right or On wrong what? answer, of course. <laughs> but uh, I would say um, it, I think the main factor is how competitive is the residency you are looking for. Uh, if it's a very competitive spe specialty, as probably the surgical ones or dermatology, ophthalmology, etc., uh, you're probably going to need it. And it's not only for the publications. It's uh, it's more about the networking and the um, contacts you made. Uh, but during the year, you have to show your uh, capacity, your hardworking, your results. And with, with results, uh, it, we mean publications, right? So I think people that are going for a very competitive either institution or specialty might consider a research fellow. It's not mandatory, of course, but that helps a lot with the uh, networking. 100% agree. Isabella, a research I fellow? I have to agree with Gab that there's no, there's no easy answer for that. There's no right or wrong. I think depends on a lot also on how much you're genuinely interested in research. Because sometimes, and it's, it's okay, I'm not saying it's a bad thing, it's okay if publishing is just a means to get where you want to get. Maybe you don't necessarily want a super academic career and you just, you know, we often share in the, the Meta Analysis Academy social media this one chart that is like ha the average number of publications for each specialty uh, for matching here in the un United States. And you'll see like, seven, eight publications, time might be better spent if you just want to reach that number to be considered for, you know, one institution, for a strong candidate, you might as well just sit at home for six months, work on six month analysis and publish that. That will save you time, money, effort, brain cells, many things. So if research is just a means for you to get, for example, a match that not necessarily super academic. There's no need. If you don't love it, don't like go spend time where you love. The spoiler right? is that sometimes you get in love. Sometimes the you process. get in love. <laughs> that's not true. <laughs> yeah, I think that's the point. Um, my family even says, Amanda, I you used to say five, six years ago that you would never get into research. Yeah. I never thought. I never thought. And I think my take on it is... Then the meta-analysis academy. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And now I want a clinical and academic career. So it's, it, it, it is but life that's changing. It, exactly. It's a, so then it comes. If you want, if that's mm -hmm. what you want and you really are interested in learning the method, learning how research works, like in the background, you know, these slow, slow trials, how that works, everything that is involved you learn a lot. Of course you learn a lot. Like I learned things that I didn't like I didn't even didn't even know it existed until 2 months ago and now it's my daily work. Mm -hmm. um, but I I love it. <laughs> I love it. This I love it because I love research. But I think Gabby said the key aspects there are one networking if you want a competitive specialty. That really is game changing the people you will meet, the influential people you will meet, you just might as well in one day be sitting with a program director next to you and you didn't even know. Um, but again, each case is a case. That's not mandatory and you might as well publish if you're at home, wherever you are in the world. It's yeah. fine, it depends on the person. And not every research fellow is gonna be the same. Not every research exactly. fellow is gonna make yeah. you stand out. So Definitely. it really depends. Go ahead. I, I have, of course, I, I haven't done a research on myself yet, but I have spoken to a lot of people yeah. that have. And I think my kind of take up today, it's it's that 
there's no point in doing a research fellow if you just want publications, right? You exactly. need to get m something more yeah. in the, that year. And I know people who had no publications and came to do a research fellow here in the States and got disappointed because they were expecting and something left that... left with zero publications. Exactly, the exactly. And I, I know, know people that, that well. also got it to do a research fellow, saw the reality of how things were, got into the Meta-Analysis Academy, and then started publishing, right? So I think about if it's about publications, you know, you might be best spending your time in meta-analysis, for example. Agreed. But if you have the interest, if you want to connect with people, I definitely think that it does have value. And if you mix both, then yeah, that's the success. That's the I mix both. I use my two box and mm -hmm. it makes. So great. let me give the one minute summary of this, which I, I fully agree with everything that you said. First of all, if the specialty is super competitive, you absolutely should consider doing it. It's likely to be almost mandatory for some specialties. Number two, if there's a genuine strong interest in learning research, it, we should also consider it. Now, number three, it's not mandatory by any means. And if you decide to do it, first of all, get publications before you apply. You're going to become a stronger applicant. Multiple of our students from the Meta Analysis Academy have used their publications to then apply to a strong research fellowship, like Isabella Marques, uh, for example. But if you decide to do it, for the sake of having publications um, for an application, be conscious of two important points. Number one, by no means are publications and networking guaranteed. Don't put all your tokens, all your hopes in the research fellowship because a number of things could go wrong. Obviously, we hope that if everything works out, but you can go to a place and your mentor moves, your mentor doesn't help you, it's not supportive, you know, the institution is going through some problems. So there's a number of reasons on why it may not work out. And if the metric is publications that you're looking for, and it's an important metric, join the Meta-Analysis Academy or, you know, figure it out independently. Don't put all your hopes in that and then forget to do everything else. And then the number two, uh, the second point I want to highlight that people often forget is the value of time. You know, when we're young and um, thinking about a career that's going to last 40 years, you know, we, we don't generally think about the value of one or two years to get us to the next step, which is generally a competitive residency. And that's fine. But let me say that from a person who did nine years of residency and fellowship in the United States, these years will add up. Essentially, if you're doing a research fellowship when you don't have to or you don't have a strong interest in research, you're doing it just for the sake of doing it, you're paying a high price, which is training, changing or trading one future year of being an attending, of having attending income, salary, uh, for a research fellow right now. And that has financial implications. It's going to extend the number of years in training. And it might not be an issue now, but, you know, send me a message when you're <laughs> seventh year res into residency and fellowship and, you know, you understand what I'm saying. So balance these things. And if you decide to do it, do it complementary to the publications, like the beautiful example here of Gabriela Brandão. Yeah, but I will actually take a chance to comment that. I think doing mat analysis before applying for the postdoc were essential for my application because also like it's a postdoctoral position they kind of expect you to already know more or less what you're doing of course they're hiring you to do they're research they're hiring you yeah. to do, research. You to do they, research yeah you're not there to learn the basics of research they don't have the time to do that they don't expect that from you and they will not pay you to do that uh, so I think I when I applied when I got the guts to apply actually I already had like seven eight publications that's when I felt like oh my god okay someone might actually pay me some attention and it was actually great because they did my my current boss um, principal investigator he did comment on that he did say wow you actually have a lot of publications it like it's a lot more than the average person in your level of you know uh, training and as a last year medical student so that was actually the main reason why he trusted me enough to hire me to do research full time. So without that, I don't like I don't really think there was any other reason that he would trust me enough with that. So even if you want to do a postdoc, if you want to apply, maybe Gabby might experience like share her experience on that. But I think you also have to bring something to the table. Oh, so sure. even if you want to apply, you have to prepare for that. And you have to have publications to show before that. Yeah, I yeah. think uh, one uh, value of that is kind of when you 
show that you are able and capable of going from the start to the end with the project. Mm -hmm. First, you show uh, how you manage your time, how you manage your tasks, but also like a manuscript, writing a manuscript is writing a manuscript. It doesn't matter much what kind of research. And when you can uh, write it fast, write it very objectively, you already know half of the way. So yeah. that applies for every research, right? It's the proven result, you know, there's, yeah. it's not, when you're, especially for first author, you know, you show that on your CV, it's done. Like people yeah. know that you know how to do the work, that you get it done because lots of people know about research but don't actually get things done and it's just it makes your application for a research fellowship for residency for whatever it is in your career it's just like totally different if you have publications especially if they're high quality and if you're a first author yeah. so we're in boston right now and the weekend we're recording this well at the time we're recording this there's um, lots of events in the meta-analysis academy where students are participating so in sao paulo brazil there's one of the, lar the largest one of the largest cardiology conferences we have multiple students presenting here in boston we have endocrine 2024 you will know better than me amanda but i'm sure there are at least uh, 10 if not 20 people presenting here uh, we also have the American Society of Clinical Oncology with more than 10 students presenting in Chicago at this time. And we have Transplant. the American Transplant yeah. Congress in Philadelphia. <laughs> with have my friends there. Yeah, yeah there's lots of friends, uh, Gabriela's friends presenting uh, meta-analysis and surgery. And I um, actually just saw one of them posting it today. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about this experience of going to conferences and like, but especially going when you're presenting. And Amanda, I'm going to ask you because you're a veteran at this, two years in a row with oral presentations <laughs> at Endocrine Society. What's it like, you know, to go to these conferences and just like be queen, you know, like <laughs> presenting? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, please stop. But I, I do have to say that I, I, I haven't expected the amount of or presentations that I've had. I, I've had it in at least five conferences now, and it does build, grow some skin yeah. on you. Um, so for this one, of course, you can never get used to it, but it does make you a lot more comfortable with the aspect. And right now, I focus on not only just presenting and getting it done with, because I think that on my first presentation, that's how it was. I was so scared. I just want to get it over with. I, I, I'm so nervous right now. I'm focusing on how can I communicate my research because our presentations do bring visibility to the topic that you're talking about, to the research that you are presenting. And also, I think the most interesting thing is the comments that you get after your presentation. I agree. And the invitations that you also get. I, I know some people even that after our presentations got invitations from journals to high impact journals like that. Lancet. So with my experience with oral presentations, of course, manuscripts and getting publications on PubMed are completely priority. But conferences are great for networking. And when you network, I think that's when things really, really trigger uh, for the success in your career and the progression. Because I think we really depend on connection with other people. You find new mentors, you find new inspirations, sources of inspiration. And even in this conference just now, so just yesterday, we went to a talk, uh, me and Larissa, who is the other second year medical student who presented six, mm -hmm. six abstracts in this conference. For the second time. For the second time. She was time here last year as well as a first year medical she student. She is incredible. She is incredible. We both went to this talk um, and we had, we were listening to professionals that we had met, met last, last year, very high impact. And we went to have a chat with them afterwards. And one of them recognized my name from a paper that I had published. And they took a picture, they tweeted about it, they put the paper in there as well, loved reading your work. Yikes. And uh, we got even more people commenting on it and a track on Med Twitter. If you don't know about it, please do get involved because it, it is powerful. And I, I think that's the beauty of it. Even Larissa, as we were speaking, people are just so shocked how she's a second year medical student presenting at one of the largest conferences in the world for endocrinology. So I think the I think that's the benefit of all presentations, posters, presentations in conferences, and it is something that meta analysis really, really adds. I I recently went even to one of the cities in the UK, and 
imposter syndrome is a thing for everyone, everyone. And I submitted this research that oh, it had been on the process that we were conducting, it had been published, and I was just so disappointed by it. And thankfully, with the methods that we learned in the Meta Analysis Academy, I was able to change it a little bit, and now we submit it to, for publications with some changes. But I submitted the abstract, and it got an oral presentation. I got to the conference, and I did not know that I was in the session for the five presentations that were for a prize. Wow. Um, and I had some colleagues there that are doing primary research with me, and they said, Amanda, you are, you know, you're against X person who is a PhD who publishes so much on surgery. And I'm like, it's okay, I'm here for the experience. <laughs> I went up there on the stage and um, I, was, I wasn't nervous before because I wasn't expecting much. Because for me, it was a disappointment that my research had been published and I had to change it. I went there, got really nervous beforehand and presented. And guess what? The one, one prize, the most prestigious prize of the organization that's given to one abstract in the whole conference was awarded to our paper. No way. Yeah. How yeah. are we wow. only finding out about this? Yeah. She got used to it, guys. She no. doesn't even comment wow. anymore when she gets a prize no. on a meta-analysis. No, but I think that, I think that's, that's the, you know, I just never thought that I could be in that situation. Wow. And it's because of meta-analysis. People, it brings you visibility. It and really awards does. so valued. Yeah, and I, I even, I got back to my seat after presenting, thinking, okay, now is gone. I presented among these <laughs> incredible people. I'm going to go away now. And as I was leaving through the door, because I had to catch my train to go back yeah. to the city that I'm from, um, I hear my name on the stage. And I'm like, I don't care if I miss the train right now. I'm going to go get <laughs> all of right? course. So, oh my God. Yeah, I, I think it's, it's incredible, Congrats. these conferences as well. I think it's a great opportunity. Again, things that add to your CV, stories that you can tell and people that you can connect with. I just want to add a quick story to this. You mentioned when you were saying, so the, we had a similar situation in um, Amsterdam, Netherlands, European Society of Cardiology, 2023, last year. And one of our students, uh, Mariana, presented an oral presentation as well. And afterwards, the associate editor of one of the Lancet journals, uh, eClinical Medicine, this, uh, this associate editor was in the audience and spoke with her later on after the presentation saying that she enjoyed the talk and that she invited Mariana to submit her paper to this journal. And it's a high impact journal. I forget the impact factor now, but I think it's 14. I could be mistaken. Uh, it's again, it's one of the Lancet uh, journals from the family Lancet. And Mariana did, you know, with not such high hopes, but she submitted it. They requested revisions. Our, and uh, the paper was accepted. You know, it's, oh a, it's a great story and uh, came from oral presentation as well. Larissa, who's just here, you mentioned also, she's a second year med student and she's in touch with the president of the Brazilian Society of Endocrinology who knows her from the conferences where she's presenting. <laughs> so, you know, uh, great stories. I could, I could go on and on. But I want to ask yeah. Gabriela about her experience as well because I've definitely seen you on the podium from oh, some yeah. uh, conferences. I did uh, two f uh, following years for the podium. And the two of them were uh, meta-analysis. The last one was my application year and was gorgeous wow. to see. Visibility. Yeah, it was a very uh, big audience and it was a very, like a controversial topic that I was closing, uh, like summarizing what we should do, like drain or not drain. Which conference was that? Uh, the American College of Surgeons. Wow. So the, just one, the, big, right? the biggest, wow. yeah. Or and a it, presentation. Or, yeah, and it was very, uh, so it was very like a controversial topic. Everybody was excited. And then just after the, the presentation, like everybody came to ask more about it. Like, well, how do you do? Or uh, what are the conclusions? What are we going with that? What do you agree or not? So we you became have, the reference. Yeah, we came, we have such a good discussion, and one of one of the discussion was with one uh, associate program director, which I was interviewed later. So it was even more special. It was awesome. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. To me, I would just add like it's crazy. Gabby saying how she really closed a gap in literature, and that is so like that is such. An amazing aspect of meta-analysis and just one of these days I was checking the social media meta-analysis academy social media and saw a med student that was cited on an international guideline for something and it's like guys <laughs> these people are getting cited by guidelines yeah. solving the problems that are there like oh we're liking this information like we don't know very well 
and mm. one of our students are yep. getting the, the answer. The <laughs> name of the legend is Mateus Gauza. He's a six-year medical student. He was cited with his group of co-authors in the uh, an international guideline. And uh, not just him, but multiple of our students, you know, you get papers like Gabriela's paper, you know, if you do a high quality meta-analysis, be ready, it's going to be cited in international guidelines. That's for sure. Yeah. Definitely. And I, again, another thing that brings you visibility and what separates primary research from meta-analysis, it's a common theme. We, primary research is very valuable, but you see the guidelines citing the meta-analysis and I'm sorry, but if you can bring that into an interview, your your paper being cited by a yeah. guideline and you solving a clinical issue, I think that's a, a great conversation started <laughs> and a great contributor exactly. to convincing that person that, yes, you do have value because you speak a lot about this, about how mentorship works. Many people are not bringing value to the table, and I think that's what missing. What's missing in meta-analysis definitely do that. Yeah, it's one of the ways. You know, certainly um, whenever you are, whether it's in a research fellowship or in any other in situation where you're a, a mentee and you have a mentor, you really need to show your value. There's no doubt about that. So um, we're coming to a wrap here. Um, I want to give you all the opportunity to do some final considerations, and um, I'm going to start with Isabella. Ooh, no pressure. Just my final consideration is, wow, it was a good talk. Like, it's so many things that I have to wrap up now, but I'll just, I think I'll just go to the most basic aspect that I, we started this talk saying how much me and Amanda, we don't even remember the pre meta analysis Academy, Isabella and Amanda, and that's because so many things changed and achievements that I would never have expected, doors that were opened that I could never imagine. And I think the value of, of getting into the community and learning how to do this yourself with autonomy, with your power of controlling the time of that is you're able to dream so much bigger than you initially expected. And that's just it. Sometimes we just get so focused, focused in the like rushing with everything, just getting this one path that everyone tells you, just do this and it will work out. And then you come a little bit out of curve, you learn something new and it opens a whole new world. And I think that's really what meta-analysis changed in my life. And yeah, I just have to be grateful here, meeting all these amazing people that I have been working with together for like two years. Mm -hmm. And it's a community everywhere. It's amazing. Yeah, I, I, I love this community. And it's a really hard thing to summarize all of our experiences, all the amazing people that we have met and all the 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 network that we have built over the years into just the summary. So I'm really glad that we're starting this this new series of talks that we're going to be discussing so much about meta-analysis. But if I can summarize in three things, I get so many questions about potential students that want to enroll in Meta Academy, in Meta-analysis Academy. Um, is it a secret formula? Is it just a magic recipe? And Definitely, definitely it's very powerful, definitely feels magical, but it's not. And I often bring three things to them. First, the effective method. And you're definitely going to get that in the Meta Analysis Academy. You're definitely going to know to how to create autonomy, how to know every step of the way. We'll guide you with that. You saw in Bella's example how she was able to take it after the course finished, a week after she submitted for publication. So that's one thing, a really powerful method that meta-analysis provide, as you have seen through today. The second one is the mindset. We have been speaking here about hard work, dedication, and that's definitely not different with meta-analysis. You're going to have to put the effort in, but the difference is that the effort that you're putting in definitely bears fruit. It definitely counts, and you're going to get a lot from it. And the third one, which Bella touched upon, is the community. And we are all, I believe, so happy to be part of it, of the second family that has a lot of collaboration. And when you connect with like-minded individuals that have this growth mindset, then you're sorted. So if you have any interest in those three things, because they have to be together, by, by the dream that Meta Academy provides, because it's, it's a really good one and you're going to go very far. So I think that's my little bit of a summary. I have to say that the method uh, really opens do like open doors, but what really matters in the academy is definitely the people, and it's the people for some reasons. I think 
uh, networking is one of them. You can network among the other uh, mentees and the other students, attendings, even like we have brilliant people in the community. Uh, but also like uh, meta analysis research is, be is becoming uh, more competitive. Like it's very, you have to publish fast. The methods, it can be complex in some topics and we have experts for every single step of the way. Like yourself. <laughs> no, not like myself, but there are some people that are brilliant in statistics, very complex models, and we have we have them all together uh, helping each other, and I think that's priceless, really. Yeah, no, thank you so much, and congratulations to all of you. I'm going to actually take three closing points here. I'm going to cheat and not to just, just one. Number one is that I want to emphasize just how grateful and thankful I am to all the people who made the Meta Analysis Academy happen. You know, Amanda's our director of social media. Isabella has been uh, an ambassador, has been a, a tutor in the program. Gabriela is a mentor in the program. And so many people that I, I wouldn't have time to mention the great contributions, the support that our students have, uh, the community that was mentioned multiple times. It's all credit to the great people who make it happen. And uh, number two, I want to emphasize the same point that I I talked about in the beginning. All the results that you've heard from them, but also from the hundreds of students that have joined the Meta-Analysis Academy is really the results of their hard work, their dedication. We provide the method. We do not do publications. Publications are not guaranteed. It's up to you and our students to really take the opportunities, the method, and really take that forward and bring it to publication. And my final message is for you to join the Meta-Analysis Academy if you're not a part yet of this team, to learn how to conduct high impact research with autonomy to transform your career. That's our mission and I hope you will join us.